You know what? Let's just open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. No funny story, no intro, no uh, hook to get you listen. Let's just jump right into what Jesus has to say about this issue. Verses 27 through 30. You ready? You sure? Here we go. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Okay, now, can we just admit that if you don't have any sort of Christian background or knowledge of the Bible, that sounds crazy. Does that sound crazy? And maybe you're used to hearing that sort of thing. But if you didn't grow up in the church or aren't familiar with Jesus' teachings or don't know what the context is, that sounds like crazy talk. Think about it. Just looking at someone a certain way means you've committed the act. No, it doesn't. And what's this business with self-mutilation? Gouging out eyes and cutting off hands? This is one of the reasons, I think, if we're just honest, that people outside of the Christian faith go, that, they're nuts. I mean, they're sexually repressed, they're pent up, and they're, they, they read crazy stuff. So what in the world is Jesus talking about here? Well, one thing is for sure. Inside the church or outside, if you're honest, Jesus makes us all a little uncomfortable. And I, I actually hope that he does that to us this morning. I think it's good that we're uncomfortable at times. But let's put this teaching in context for Jesus. So this is part of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, it, it was very likely a part of a sermon that he gave, but most scholars think that the Sermon on the Mount contains a sermon he gave plus sort of the best of Jesus' teachings. And what's he really doing in the Sermon on the Mount? Well, if you go back in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is, te- is baptized in the Jordan River, then he's tempted in the wilderness, he comes out of his temptation, and he's ready to embark on his public ministry. And the, Matthew says that Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages and synagogues, proclaiming and teaching about the good news of the kingdom of God. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about the central, what Jesus' favorite subject? Anybody know? The kingdom. That's his message. He's always talking about life in the kingdom. What the Sermon on the Mount is, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is really an exposition of what life in the kingdom looks like. What does it look like for a person, man or woman, to live with Jesus as your king, to bring all of your life under the rule and reign of Jesus? That's what he's talking about when he goes through it. So it's not theoretical or abstract. It's intensely practical. And he talks about, he gets right up in your business. He talks about marriage and divorce and lust and money and serving and all kinds of things. Because the kingdom is not a theory, it's life right now in the flesh with Christ as our king, bring our life under his rule and reign. And so we come to this teaching. Now, I'm going to say something just at the outset here. He's teaching this, he's saying this. If you read, it goes up on a mountainside, his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. The them is the disciples. Disciples is not a spiritual term for the elite. It literally, it simply means those who have wrestled with who Jesus is and surrendered themselves to him. So the people who have already reckoned with who he claims to be and surrendered their life. Not perfect people, but you're bringing your life under his rule and reign. That's who he's talking to. Now there's crowds around too. So there's other people that are listening to this that are not yet, they haven't yet reckoned with who he is. They haven't yet brought their lives under his rule and reign. They might be curiosity seekers, they might be skeptics, they might be close but not yet there. And I would presume that perhaps in the room this morning some of you are in both camps, right? Some of you are... You, you know who Jesus is, and you're not, life isn't perfect, you don't have it all together, but you know who he is, he is your king, and you're trying to bring your life under his reign. He's talking to you. Some of you might be more like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there, I'm not sure yet, and I've surrendered to him. So when he talks about sexual desire, lust, he's talking to people who have already wrestled with who he is. I think the church puts the cart before the horse sometimes with this one. Like What he's saying is, if you ha- are surrendering your life to me as your king, then we've got to talk about this area of your life, because it matters. It matters more than you know. But if you haven't yet surrendered to him as king, then I would say, don't start with that. Start with who Jesus is. Wrestle with who he is. Once you have decided he's my king, then you're going to have to deal with what he says about this area of life. Okay, does that make... Hopefully you can self-identify where you are, because that really matters. And we want to tell you here at Chapel Street Church, there's room for you if you're still figuring this out. All right. He says, you've heard it said. This was Jesus' favorite way of referring to the Old Testament Mosaic law. You've heard it said, and he would go on throughout Matthew 5, 6, and 7 to quote or refer to some passage in the Old Testament. And then he would say, but I tell you this. 
and he would lay his teaching right alongside of it. Now, when he does that, he's not dismissing the Old Testament law or saying it's obsolete or it doesn't matter or you shouldn't listen to it. He's affirming it, fulfilling it, and saying, but let's talk about what the law is really about. It's always about the heart, not the action. So he talks about, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. That's the action. Adultery, by the way, is any sexual activity outside the covenant relationship of marriage. We'll get to that in a minute. And he says, but I'm telling you, we've got to go back upstream from there. We've got to back way up river and talk about where does this begin? What causes a man or a woman to break a covenant vow? I've been with marriages that have been undone by this. I don't know of one yet where the guy wakes up and just says, you know, today's the day. I'm going to break my vow today. It starts way earlier. So Jesus is talking about that. I'm telling you something that you need to know about what goes on in the heart long before this action ever takes place. And, well, let's just, the first thing he's really referring to, or the backdrop, is what we want to call the divine design of sex. The divine design of sex. So underneath this specific teaching on sexual desire, Jesus has an entire view of what sex and marriage is that's defined by Genesis 1 and 2. In fact, all of, everything in the Gospels goes back to the first three chapters of Genesis. Who we are, who God is, how we're supposed to live. If you don't get Genesis 1 through 3 and understand it, the Gospel doesn't make much sense. So Jesus is talking about this in the context of a worldview shaped by what God designed. Let me read to you verses 24 and 25 of Genesis chapter 2. And by the way, before this is, this is the end of chapter 2. This is the part where God makes man and woman in his image. And he makes woman out of the rib he takes from man. And he, brings, he puts the man to sleep. And he brings the man to. And what does the man say? Whoa, man. That's why she's called woman. Maybe you didn't know that. No. I, I've always liked that joke. I know it's bad, but I think it's funny. But, but, so he brings the woman to him. And what does Adam do? Sings this love poem. At last, Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she's for me and I'm for her. So Christians, some people think Christians are prudes or sexually repressed. In the very second chapter of the Bible, you got a naked man saying to a naked woman in front of God. It's pretty cool if you think about it. And this is how it finishes. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So much in those two verses. We don't have time to unpack all of it. But that's the backdrop in which Jesus says what he says about sexual desire. It's really important for us to get that. So in brief, because a couple chapters later, which we won't deal with this morning, Jesus lays out the biblical vision of marriage. But in brief, the, the, the fundamental Christian ethic, sexual ethic is this. All sexual activity outside of the covenant relationship of marriage, one man, one woman for life, is outside of what God desires for us, intends for us, and what's best for us. I know that's not culturally popular, but I'm not supposed to tell you what's culturally popular. I'm supposed to tell you what the Word of God says. That's the biblical teaching, and that's what Jesus is laying out for us. And when he set, talks about sexual desire, that's the backdrop for his teaching. You won't get him unless you get that. Okay, covenant, I've used that word a couple times. It's a critical concept here. Covenant is a fancy Bible word for binding, lasting, sacred promise. It's the fundamental way God relates to us. He's the ultimate covenant keeper, well, even though we are covenant breakers. And we know that because of the cross and the empty tomb, that he keeps his promises even when we waver and are unfaithful. And he calls us in, between a man and a woman to live in a covenant relationship, a binding, sealed promise. Timothy Keller writes about the difference between what he calls a covenant relationship and consumer relationships in his book on marriage, what he wrote with his wife, Kathy. Let me just go through, I think this is helpful to go through this with you. In a consumer relationship, which define our culture, you are the priority. In a covenant relationship, the other person is the priority and the relationship itself. In a consumer relationship, you're focused on your needs and desires and having them met. In a covenant relationship, you're focused on the other person's needs and desires. In a consumer relationship, you're focused on what you're getting. What are you receiving? What am I getting out of this? In a covenant relationship, you're focused on what am I giving? In a consumer relationship, it's, it's insecure and unstable because it could end at any time. Even if you're in one, you know this to be true, right? I mean, I like this person. He's cute. She's nice. We get along well. I, I'm, we're committed, kind of, but I'm willing to trade up. I'm always sort of looking, even if I say I'm not, because there's no real lasting commitment here. So it's insecure and unstable. A covenant relationship 
is stable and secure and protected. A consumer relationship is based on feelings and passions that change and fade with time. They come and go. A covenant relationship is based on a faithfulness to a promise you make, regardless of how you feel at any given moment. And finally, despite all the rhetoric of our culture, a consumer relationship is far less free. We hear that, right? Well, I'm, I want to be free from the, the, you know, being bound up and committed because then I could try it out and see if it works. That's the myth of our culture. That's actually less free. Inside of a covenant relationship, you're protected, you're secure, you're safe, and you're actually free. We have it backwards in our culture. There's much more to say about that, but I won't belabor the point. The point is, God designed sex and sexual desire not to be a consumer good, but a covenant good. It doesn't work in a consumer relationship. It only damages people. But it's beautiful and powerful in a covenant relationship. That's what he's after here. That's why Jesus takes this so seriously. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. The Apostle Paul, writing about the difference between this kind of sexual sin and other sins, he says this, Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. What's he saying there? He's not saying God is, is, loves you less if you commit this kind of sin. Not at all. He's talking about a reality in our soul, in our life, and in our world. There's something different about sexual sin. Those of you who have been damaged by it, carry shame from it. You know this. There's something different about it. This is why he's saying that there's something deep and powerful here. And in fact, when Jesus says it's better to your, that for one, lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell, sounds a little extreme. When he uses the word he uses for hell is the Aramaic word Gehenna. It didn't refer actually to like everlasting, like, your, like eternal damnation. Uh, although people made that later on interpreted that way. It referred to a specific place outside of Jerusalem, a ravine, a pit where they dumped refuse and garbage and it was always burning, perpetual burning. Makes sense in the context of lust. He's saying, so, so let, just take fire. Fire is the classic example, right? Is fire good? So you're like, no, yes. I go, mm. It kind of depends, right? Fire, what, is, what does Tom Hanks say in Castaway? I have made fire. Right? It's good because he can have light and warmth and heat and cook his food. It's a, it's a great gift. But fire can be incredibly destructive. I always tell this story about when I was in college playing football. I spent a summer working at a camp and on my home. I stopped by one of my teammates' house. He lived in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Hung out with him, and his parents were out of the country. We hung out there. We worked out together and had some good, whatever they eat in Oklahoma, steak mostly. Anyway, his parents had asked him to burn some brush in the backyard. They had like four or five acres in the backyard. And so we did that, and we went out to eat. We, we, it's summertime in Oklahoma, so we sprayed it all down with water for about a half an hour or more, thinking we had it doused good, and we went to, to eat. We came back and fell asleep on the couch watching a movie. I woke up to the sound of some guy banging on his screen door. I look up, and I, I was like I was in a movie. This guy's wearing all denim with a belt buckle, boots, and a hat. He says, hey, you know your gall darn backyard's on fire? And there was a wall of flames eight feet high across five acres of his backyard. And he said, I, I saw the smoke from the highway. I know you boys wasn't roasting no weenies over here. So I came over here to warn you. <laughs> I'm like, what? We went out with garden hoses and shovels. It burned my eyebrows off. It melted through the hose. It burned the handle of the shovel. We had to call the big trucks to come in and put out the brush fire. Burned his entire yard. Four acres, like little Charlie Brown matchstick trees and black earth all the way across. <laughs> Talk about being in trouble when your parents get home, right? Fire is incredibly destructive. What happened? Well, we doused the top of it. Hot wind blows. Un uncovers the, the wet part, and there's those hot embers smoldering underneath, and it burned the whole place. It would have burned the whole house if that guy hadn't come and knocked on the door. Maybe us in it. So the fire it, is incredibly powerful. It's necessary. It's good. It can also burn the house down, burn your life down, burn up the culture. And it does. This is the danger and destruction of lust. God intends sex as a unique gift between a man and a woman inside the covenant protected relationship of marriage and where a man says to a woman, a woman says to a man, I belong wholly and completely to you. You can't extract it. Lewis, C.S. Lewis writes about this in Mere Christianity. I, I know I quote him a lot, but you really, if you've not read Mere Christianity, his chapter on, on, the, on the sexual ethic of Christianity alone is worth reading. He writes, the monstrosity of sexual intercourse outside of marriage is this. 
it, those who indulge in it are trying to isolate one kind of union, sexual union, from all other kinds of union, emotional, spiritual, and so on, which are meant to go along with it and make up the complete and total union. The Christian attitude doesn't mean there's anything wrong about sexual desire. It means you must not isolate that pleasure and try to get it by itself any more than you ought to try to get pleasure of taste without swallowing and digesting because ch by chewing things and spitting them out again. Sounds gross, but you get what he's saying? The, the union as a whole, intimacy as a whole, relational, emotional, spiritual, and physical go together in God's plan inside a covenant relationship. And we live in a culture which wants to extract sexual union and say, this is good by itself. This is good over here. And it's not. It's, it'll burn down the house. This is essentially what lust is. It's desiring pleasure without a person or a promise. Now I want to point something out here that I think sometimes the church hasn't always done right. Jesus is not saying that it's wrong to have sexual desires. If he designed, divinely designed sex, then how could it be wrong to have desire as part of the design? And I think a lot of young men and women grow up thinking even the thoughts, the desire is bad. It isn't bad. And he's not saying that it's wrong to notice that someone is attractive or beautiful physically. He's not saying that. I mean, if, if he, think about it for a minute. There's an entire book of the Old Testament devoted to the celebration of sexual love between a man and a woman. Did you know that? Song of Songs. It's, if you blush easily, I'd like to watch you read it. Right? Just so you, just, just, just so you know, if, when you read it, when it talks about pomegranates, they're not pomegranates. Okay? People can't even get themselves to like, like deal with this. Do you know that was read annually in the synagogues for young Jewish, little Jewish boys and girls? If some of you are a little nervous and embarrassed right now, think about growing up as a little Jew in the first century. They're going to read the Song of Songs out loud in front of your parents. Ah! Right? The Bible's not prudish or repressed or pent up. It celebrates it in its place. So if Jesus is not talking about desire per se, or, or noticing someone's beautiful. What's he talking about? What's he getting at? Look at verse 28 again of Matthew 5. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. There's a lot that to unpack here. Looking with lustful intent. He's talking about what happens after you notice. He's talking about what happens after you feel the desire. Now, the word look in English can mean like notice, see, look, stare. He's talking about a particular kind of look. The intent gaze. The intentional stare. In which, this is like Jeff's translation and it's not official, but this is how I would put it. Looking lustfully means to stare at someone in order to fuel the movie in your own head in order to feed your own fantasy. To see them not as an individual that matters to God, but as an object from which you extract pleasure. That's what he's talking about. Now, if you're a woman who's been victimized by this kind of stare, you know exactly what Jesus is talking about. And I guess almost all of you do. If you're a man who's perpetrated this stare or been victimized by it, you know exactly what Jesus is talking about. I don't have to explain it to you. You know. And, and the word used for looking lustfully is a single Greek word. It's a compound word. It's you'll see on the screen here. It's the word epithemia. Epi, is the prefix meaning, um, literally means upon or over. Themia is desire or longing. An over desire. And a longing out of control. It means desire out of control. Maybe better put, a desire that we can't control that controls us. The prevailing cultural myth is this. Sex is like any other desire or appetite in human life. And the way, the path to fulfillment and happiness in life is not to suppress your desires, but to pursue them and to have them fulfilled. In fact, your identity should be shaped by your desires. That, we're being told that everywhere you turn. And it's a lie. It's a lie. And you know it's not true. Even apart from the Bible, you know it's not true. If sex were like any other desire, we, we would see bad poetry in love songs to bacon. We don't write songs like that about food. We don't write songs like that about new shoes. 
right? The history is full of bad poetry celebrating a different kind of desire. We just know it's different. You know it. And beyond that, just answer this question in your own heart. If you aggressively pursue the fulfillment of every appetite and every desire you have, any of them, would that be good for you? If you got full fulfillment of every single desire, would that be healthy for you and the people around you? No. You know it wouldn't. Lewis writes again, Surrender to all our desires obviously leads to impotence, disease, jealousies, lies, concealment, brokenness, and everything that is the reverse of health, joy, and honesty. Any happiness, even in this world, quite a lot of restraint is going to be necessary. So the claim made by every desire in our soul, when it is strong, we need it to be healthy and counts for nothing. This is what Jesus is saying to us in 528. Desire out of control causes a person to violate a sacred covenant. Because here's, this is, when you, when you stare at somebody to feed the movie in your head, or th even if you're not staring, you're staring internally, thinking about them that way, you're saying something about what you believe other people exist for. That's what I'm doing when I do that, if, when you do that. You're saying they exist for me. Other people exist as objects of, to fulfill my desires and pleasures. You're saying that other people exist for your pleasure, for your good. That's the exact opposite of the central ethic of the kingdom. What's Jesus' favorite message? The kingdom. What's the undergirding principle of the kingdom? Love. What is love? Self-sacrificing. Giving of yourself for the good of the other. The foundational principle of love is not fulfilling of my desires, but to lay myself down for the good of the other. So when you stare at someone that way, you're doing the exact opposite. And I, we don't see this in our culture. It's a violation of the central kingdom ethic of love. Love protects and elevates and honors the other person, the image of God in them. Looking lustfully does the opposite. It dehumanizes them, diminishes them, objectifies them, and degrades yourself. This is why Jesus gets so intense about it and sounds so crazy and extreme. Now, in our culture, if we say, Jesus says, you've already committed adultery with them. Adultery, we know inside the church, at least we're supposed to know, it's not, it's not, a, it's not good. God's not pleased. But in our culture, we, we celebrate it, right? I mean, it's, they make TV shows that celebrate this. The, the whole foundational principle is like, what's going on? Who's sleeping with who? So what I mean is we're living in a world in which this is not that big a deal. We kind of wink at it. But what if I changed the way Jesus said it for our contemporary cultural context in this moment? What if it read this way? Anyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has sexually abused her in his heart, has sexually assaulted her in his heart. Same principle. Same fundamental principle. You exist for me. You're not a person that I should honor, protect, and elevate and lay my life down for. You exist to fuel my desires. I think Jesus probably would put it that way in our culture. The, qu the question is this in the kingdom. Are you safe in the kingdom? Are women, men, children safe in the kingdom? Ultimately speaking, the answer is yes, but if the church is a representation of the kingdom, I... I have to admit, not always. You look around our culture, not always. And that grieves God deeply. This is why Jesus is so serious about it. Are you safe with each other? You can't look at someone this way inside my kingdom. That's a betrayal of what the kingdom is. But we do. Now, of course, so... Jesus is, he is using the male pronoun. He's already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, I don't think he doesn't believe women have this struggle. I think Jesus is smart enough to know that women also can be guilty of this and fall into this trap as well. In fact, statistics are showing there's a rapid and shocking rise in the number of women in our culture who are looking at porn. 
It's rampant. Although sometimes I think for many of you it works differently. It's like the Hallmark Channel. You know, you watch those movies over and over again. If he were only like the cowboy for Christmas, then my life would be better, you know? And you objectify that guy. And he's not like what you think at all. It's the same movie over and over, by the way. The, fun, the foundational principle is the same. I think what Jesus is saying is really important for us to hear. Because there's no getting around the answer to this question. Historically, which gender has used sexual desire to oppress, abuse, and exploit the other? It's not a trick question, right? It's pretty obvious. And it should not be so in the kingdom. The kingdom should be radically different. Remember, this whole thing is a kingdom exposition. What does life in the kingdom look like? Well, a lot different than the culture you're living in. In fact, Rodney Stark in his book, The Rise of Christianity, says one of the things that made the early Christians stand out so much was that they were exactly the opposite of the Greco-Roman culture. The Greco-Romans were promiscuous with their bodies, but stingy with their wealth. And the Christians were the opposite. They were stingy with their bodies and radically generous with their wealth. Which would change a culture? Which would stand out? Okay, now in verses 29 to 30, this is the part where Jesus gets really crazy about gouging out eyes and cutting off hands. So we have some sharpened spoons in the back. And for those of you, right? Like, what is he saying here? Why does he say this? Why not just say it's really serious and you should do something about it? Why cutting things off and gouging things out? He's not, okay, I, just so we're clear, so nobody shows up with an eye patch next week. He's not actually calling us to self-mutilation. But he is saying radical surgery is needed. Radical spiritual surgery is needed. This is so serious that here's how I have to put it so you'll get it. And it's no accident that he uses eye and he uses hand. What's the eye? The eye is the way in which you see the world and see the people in the world. The hand is symbolic of the things you do in the world. What is Jesus saying? Anything in your life, anything at all, that causes you to see the world and the people in it or act in the world that I created in a way that violates my kingdom ethic, get rid of that thing. Get rid of it. Don't mess with it. Throw it out, cut it off, kill it, or it'll kill you. And nowhere is this more true than in the issue of sexual desire. It's that powerful. My son Noah told me a story about some of his buddies who were in an accountability group in college. They played football together who were struggling with this issue of lust and pornography. And they decided, you know, they having, their, having the iPhone just made it too tempting for them. And so they all decided to get flip phones for the whole year. They were the only kids on any college campus, probably anywhere, walking around. I don't know if you can buy flip phones, but they all had flip phones, right? Walking around. Why? Cut that thing off. If it's it's going to kill your soul. It isn't worth it. And I'm not even talking only about the illicit stuff, which is horrific and rampant, and a multi, multi-billion dollar industry of which our economy is based on, but nobody talks about it. I'm, I'm talking about HBO, Netflix, the stuff that's easy to see. It's rewiring young men and women's brains. It's, and older men too, and older women too, and it's damaging the way we relate to each other. I don't know of any place that better depicts this than in uh, a book that C.S. Lewis wrote called The Great Divorce. This is uh, an imaginary story Lewis wrote. It's not meant to be like, like direct theology of people from hell who take a bus trip to heaven. He doesn't think that actually can happen. And the people that visit heaven are called the ghosts. They're like not quite real. And the bright people are, are the ones that are in heaven, more real than them. And there's these interactions that are fascinating to read. And, and they, each of the people that visits have these issues they can't resolve that's causing them to not surrender and not come in to what God invites them to. And, and the one on lust is the man who has this little red lizard on his shoulder, which personifies lust. And the burning angel, one of God's messengers, comes to this man and has this conversation. Here's how it goes. Would you like me to make him quiet? Said the flaming spirit. Of course I would, said the ghost. Then I'll kill him, said the angel. Oh, uh, look, uh, you're burning me. Keep away, said the ghost, retreating. But do you want him killed? Well, you didn't say anything about killing him at first. I meant to mean to bother you with something as drastic as that. It is the only way, said the angel. Shall I kill it? Well, that's a different question altogether. I'm quite open to consider it, but it's a new point, isn't it? I mean, for the moment, I was only thinking about silencing it because up here, well, it's embarrassing. 
may I kill it? Well, there's time to discuss that later. There is no time. May I kill it? Please, I never meant to be such a nuisance. Please, really, don't bother. Look, it's gone to sleep now of its own accord. It'll be all right. Thanks ever so much. May I kill it? Honestly, I don't think there's the slightest necessity for that. I'm sure I'll be able to keep it in order now. I think the gradual process will be much better than killing it. That seems extreme. The gradual process is of no use at all. You don't think so? Well, thanks. I'll, I'll think over what you've said carefully and, and come back some other day. There is no other day. All days are present now. Get back. You're burning me. How can I tell you to kill it? You'd kill me if you did. It is not so. Well, you're hurting me now. I never said I wouldn't hurt you, only that it wouldn't kill you. Oh, I know. You think I'm a coward. Is that it? Really, it isn't. Let me, let me come back in a different moment. This moment contains all moments. May I kill it? Why are you torturing me? You're jeering at me. How can I let you tear me to pieces? If you wanted to help me, why didn't you kill it the first, when you first saw me? I cannot kill it against your will. It's impossible. Have I your permission? May I kill it? The angel's hands were almost closed on the lizard, but not quite. The lizard began chattering to the ghost so loud that even I could hear what it was saying, saying, be careful, he'll do what he says. He can kill me. One fatal word from you, and he will. Then you'd be without me forever, and where would you be? It's not natural, you know. How could you live without me? He doesn't understand. And I'll be good, I promise. I've gone over the line in the past, but I promise I won't do it again. I'll give you something really nice this time, just nice dreams. Have I your permission to kill it, said the angel again. I know it will kill me. It won't, but supposing it did. Oh, you're right. It'd be better for me to be dead than to live with this creature. Then I may? Fine, go ahead, do what you like. And then he whispers, whimpers, God help me, God help me. I read that as a young college student and it undid me. Here's how it finishes. It's so good. For a moment I could not, he, he, the, the angel grabs the, the lizard and, and the ghost gave a scream of agony such I'd never heard on earth before. The burning one closed his crimson grip on the reptile, twisted it while it writhed and screamed and flung it broken and dead to the turf. For a moment I could make out nothing distinctly. Then I saw between me and the nearest bush, unmistakably solid, but growing ever moment solider, the upper arm and the shoulder of a man. Then brighter and still stronger, the legs and hands, the neck, the golden head materialized while I watched as if my attention had not wavered. I should have seen the actual completing of a man, immense, much larger than the angel. What distracted me was the fact that at the same moment something seemed to be happening to the lizard. At first I thought the operation had failed. Far from dying, the creature was still struggling, even growing bigger as it struggled. But it changed. Its hind parts grew rounder. The tail flickering became a tail of hair and a golden mane on its neck. Suddenly I started back, rubbing my eyes. What stood before me was the greatest stallion I had ever seen in my life. Silvery white with a mane and tail of gold, smooth and shining, rippled with swells of muscle beneath its flesh, stamping its hooves. The new man turned and grabbed the horse's neck, nose its bright body, horse and master breathed into each other's nostrils. The man turned from it, flung himself at the feet of the burning one and embraced him. When he rose, I thought his face shone with tears. I had not long to think about it. In joyous haste, the man leaped upon the horse's back. Turning in his seat, he waved a farewell, then nudged the stallion with his heels. They were off before I knew what was happening. They were like a shooting star, off on the green plain, among the foothills of the mountains. Then, like a bright star, I saw them winding up and scaling what seemed impossible steeps. And quicker every moment, till near the dim brow of the landscape, so high that I had to strain my neck to see them, they vanished, bright themselves, into the rose gold brightness of the everlasting morning. I love that story. I don't know if you're getting what he's saying. This thing which controls you and you can't live without and it's eating your soul. If you let him, he'll kill it. And not only kill it, transform it into something that's glorious. God's not, Jesus doesn't hate you because you have sexual sin. He doesn't hate you because you carry shame from the past. He's not out to make you feel bad and carry this weight of guilt. He wants to set you free in a way that you can't really even imagine. I can't. But he wants us all to know. So we're going to finish by coming to his table. And I just want to, Jesus is serious about this because it's serious. We have a Thursday night men's group called Compass where that is for men battling this issue. Maybe that's you. Maybe you have 
maybe you've tried like the, like the guy in this, the ghost to, to argue about it. Well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll handle it. I'll deal with it later. You can't. You can only kill it. And he's the one that can do it for you. And he wants to do that. He will do that for all of us. So I'm going to pray and invite the band to come and, and lead as we come to his table. I just want to encourage you, right where you sit, to say your own prayer to God. Confessing if you need to and asking him to remind you of just what you heard. and What the cross means as we prepare our hearts to come to his table. Let's bow. Father God, we acknowledge your grace and mercy in our lives. We're desperately in need of it. We're broken people. We see in, in, in the world wrong. We act in the world wrong. And you want to redeem us, remake us, and set us free. So speak what we need to hear now as we prepare to celebrate through bread and cup the greatness of your love. We pray in your name. Amen.